Good afternoon. This is Claude Butner, and I have the honor of being the Master of Ceremonies today. Uh, James, or uh, Jim as he prefers, Howard Kunstler, is probably best known as the author of The Long Emergency, the Atlantic Monthly Press, 2005, and The Geography of Nowhere, Simon & Schuster, 1993. Two other nonfiction titles in that series are Home from Nowhere, Simon & Schuster, 1996, and The City in Mind, Simon & Schuster, 2002. He's also the author of many novels, including his tale of post-oil American future, World Made by Hand, the Atlantic Monthly Press, 2008, and its three sequels. His shorter work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic Monthly, Metropolis, Rolling Stone, Playboy, and many other periodicals. He has lectured at Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Princeton, Dartmouth, Cornell, MIT, RPI, the University of Virginia, and many other colleges. And he has appeared before many professional organizations, such as the American Institute of Architects, the American Psychological Association, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Kunstler takes you on a deep dive through the broken consensus about reality now besetting the nations of Western civilization in the essential matters of economy, politics, and culture. We have a lot of repair work to do in our own minds before we can coherently face the challenges to everyday life coming at us. He lays out the problems with precision and then addresses the intelligent responses to them. His emphasis, uh, he emphasizes the physical arrangement of life on the terrain of North America, the changes we are apt to see in the patterns of cities, suburbs, small towns, and the rural landscape. He says you are allowed to laugh. And uh, now under the title of Breaking Through the Fog of Unreality, I give you Jim Kunstler. Thank you, Claude. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Well, now, uh, we seem to be having a problem in Western civilization with uh, constructing a consensus about reality, uh, a coherent consensus about reality, and uh, therefore we're uh, unable to make coherent plans for what we're going to do about it. And I'm going to try to take a kind of a 30,000-foot uh, aerial view of what's going on in Western Civ and, and to some degree the the global situation as a whole. And um, maybe we'll you'll get more particular from there. And uh, here we go. So whoop, hold on. Uh, is that coming through? Did I, did I just successfully change the um... Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay, so it's changing. All right. Well, uh, the picture is starting to look a little bit like a prelude to this uh, collapse of civilization that was depicted by Thomas Cole in the 1850s, the Course of Empire series. And uh, of course, here he's depicting something like classical Rome. Uh, our society is many uh, orders of magnitude more complex than theirs was. Uh, they were... Uh, in effect, kind of the Flintstones compared to us. Everything they had to do was pretty much made by hand, and uh, but they used human labor, slavery, uh, and quite a bit of ingenuity to accomplish what they did. Uh, we're in a rather different situation with our hyper-complexity. And, uh, oh, I see what's going on. And uh, we seem to have adopted a kind of... Uh, uh, Keystone Cops, uh, clownish kind of uh, behavioral response to the predicaments that we're facing. And uh, unfortunately, as, as you may uh, infer, that's not good enough to meet a, a, an emergency of, this, of the type that we are in. So um, we've got to do something a little bit better. I'm going to try to describe this quandary that we're in. The probably principal feature of it is that it it mystifies so many of the people in our culture who would even affect to be able to think clearly. 
that is the educated classes, the thinking classes. And we also seem to be deliberately bamboozled uh, by forces that we don't necessarily understand. Uh, and we don't we can see linkages between them. And because human beings are very good at uh, pattern recognition, we're constantly trying to construct a coherent uh, pattern to understand what's happening. But it's been very frustrating to be able to do that successfully. And, you know, we're left with a lot of supposition about the various forces that are acting upon us, whether it's the World Economic Forum, uh, the... Uh, banking system and the the agents of the banking system, uh, the intelligence services, which are, are linked in the uh, Anglosphere, um, the pharmaceutical, uh, 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 the pharmaceutical industrial complex, as we I guess people are calling it now. And, uh, you know, many of the the military endeavors that our nations are involved in. And it's hard to put the pieces together. Um, we can see this much in Canada and the USA. I would say categorically, you could say we have bad leadership. Uh, we have Mr. Biden down on my side, who uh, the apprehension has just broken through a brain dead news media that Mr. Biden is not all there mentally after he's been demonstrating it for at least four years, uh, and now they have to stop pretending that he's okay. I, I don't know what you guys are pretending about Justin Trudeau in Canada, but the view from down here is that he appears to be wrecking your country and your culture and doing a very good job of it while messing with your minds. And uh, uh, I don't know how you're going to deal with him either, but we'll get on to some more considerations about politics. The net effect of all this is that the public in North America is very uh, confused and we don't know what to do. And uh, we have been subjected in the USA to uh, what I call this cavalcade of hoaxes. You know, it started eight years ago with the Russia collusion hoax uh, which was, you know, it's now been demonstrated pretty clearly that Hillary Cl Clinton started it, bought it, paid for it, sent her lawyers and agents out into the uh, Washington swamp to connect the hoax up to to link it up to the Central Int Intelligence Agency, the, the FBI, uh, uh, the other supposedly uh, 15 or 16 other intel agencies in the U.S. Uh, so we had we had uh, uh, four years of that, really, uh, in all of its iterations and, and uh, acts. Uh, and then uh, in 2019, we got the uh, first impeachment over the Ukraine call, phone call, which was another hoax. Uh, the so-called whistleblower in that hoax was a guy named Eric Chiaramella, was a, a CIA agent who um, had been placed on the National Security Council, and he was uh, in cahoots with uh, another member of the National Security Council, a U.S. Army officer and Ukrainian emigre uh, named Alexander Vindman, and uh, also with the... Uh, Inspector General of the American Intel Agencies. And uh, the Inspector General declared that you no longer had to have firsthand information as a, as a whistleblower. It could be hearsay. And under that pretense, they cooked up the whole uh, 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 Ukraine impeachment hoax, which was a failure um, but by a very narrow margin. And uh, in the meantime, we had the COVID caper, the COVID-19 caper. The Western world is still deeply bamboozled about the origin and meaning of it all. Uh, we do have pretty good reason to believe that the U.S. government was behind it and that they uh, offshored the research for it 
into Wuhan, China, although a great deal of it was going on at the University of North Carolina under Dr. Ralph Barrick and in other labs around the U.S. But eventually it seemed to have come together in Wuhan and then somehow came to the United States or not, because we're not really altogether sure whether that actually happened. But the uh, hoax was enabled by the PCR test, uh, which was... Uh, uh, a, a, te a highly unreliable test that just churned out positive uh, test results and made everybody think that they had COVID. And uh, that led, of course, to Operation Warp Speed, uh, the, uh, ad the adoption of the, the mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna and uh, Johnson & Johnson. I guess that they weren't an mRNA, mRNA vaccine, but they... They had some other form, but the two main ones were Moderna and, and Pfizer. Um, they were not properly tested. They, uh, the information controlled by our CDC and FDA was withheld from the public and from the news media. So we never really knew what uh, kind of data was coming in as a result of the, the, vac the vaccination program. But it appears that a lot of people were harmed, and it also appears pretty conclusively that the, vac the vaccine was ineffective. So, uh, and in the meantime, the pharmaceutical companies got uh, liability shields and could not be, uh, did not have to account for their failure. Then long about, uh, anyway, that's still an ongoing story. Uh, there, there's every reason to believe that the after effects of the vaccines are going to continue and perhaps escalate badly in the months and years ahead. So we'll have to stand by on that. Uh, we got the election of 2020, which uh, despite all of the BS about misinformation and disinformation emanating from the Intel blob in America uh, was almost certainly a matrix of frauds, many different varieties of fraud, all adding up to a general election fraud that produced uh, Joe Biden as president. And then we got the so-called insurrection which was really just a, a protest at the U.S. Capitol that was probably um, instigated further into a riot by our intel services. And um, then a, a massive propaganda uh, and a, a massive agitprop campaign has been going on ever since to convince the public that it was uh, some sort of a revolution and it was nothing of the kind. It was just a, really a, a, a rather innocuous riot. And um, so we have, we have had a lot of uh, uh, numbers run on us. Uh, or as we used to say back in the 60s, a lot of trips have been laid on us. And the net result of all that is that it has greatly disordered the minds of the people in the USA. And... Along with that, we have a culture that has evolved for one reason or another, and principally because of something I'm going to talk about later in this presentation, which is the way we inhabit the landscape, um, has led to a great deal of loneliness and disconnection and social disaggregation. And um, we are informed by the Psych the psychologist Matthias Desmet at the University of Ghent in Belgium, uh, we are informed with his theory that when you produce enough of that distemper in a large population and they become beset with loneliness, uh, purposelessness, anime, anxiety, that that is a ripe moment for a great social phenomenon to gel that he names the mass formation psychosis. And that's kind of what happened in the USA and in Western Civ more generally, I believe. And, you know, many of the hoaxes that have been run on the people since then have been a component of this disordering of the minds of people in Europe, Canada, North America, and Australia, New Zealand. 
And uh, let us just assume that the uh, mental disturbances continue. And I'm going to describe a little bit more in detail how they work. What, one of the things that has been very effective for those who perhaps seek to disorder our culture, our politics, and our minds is that they've captured the transmitters of information. They've captured the social media. They've captured the newspapers, the old legacy newspapers like the New York Times uh, and the Washington Post. They've captured the network cable news presenters. And um, they have been managing the news very aggressively for eight years now. And they have been aggressively censoring what people are allowed to say. And, uh, you know, this is another uh, interesting inversion with, with the mass formation psychosis. One of the and and the continued <clears throat> intel agency disinformation. One of the phenomena that you see is the inversion of uh, uh, consensual ideas that were well understood all of a sudden flipped on their head so that you get, for example, the, the idea that uh, we should be uh, in favor of free speech coming from the liberal uh, left of center part of the political spectrum for at least 100 years. They have been in favor of free speech, free expression, et cetera, et cetera. All of a sudden, over the last eight years, they are the, the biggest crusaders for censorship. Uh, under the BS idea that too much free speech equals hate speech, um, because there are so many victims out there uh, who are going to be harmed by uh, free expression. And of course, it was understood in our culture for <clears throat> centuries that in order to have a workable system of free speech, you had to admit that you would be subject to speech that might be unpleasant for you or uh, discomforting to you. And that is no longer allowed. It's no, no longer okay for people to be made uncomfortable. And of course, that is not going to work uh, with free speech. And so we seem to be veering into a new disposition of things where we can't have free speech and it's coming from left of center. And that's not good at all. Uh, you know, here you see the front page of the New York Times when the um, Ukraine telephone impeachment hoax began. And the New York Times is uh, uh, notorious for being a an agent of the CIA. Uh, in fact, all the major news outlets seem to have their own be the pet of some uh, some agency in the U.S. government. Um NBC is renowned or notorious to be the, the handmaiden of the State Department and uh, the Washington Post with the FBI, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's part of the, the capture of the transmitters. One of the uh, uh, modules in this campaign against our... Uh, polity and our culture is the attempt to turn our culture upside down and inside out. So the new religion for us in North America and, and, and in Europe and Australia uh, is uh, Satanism and demonology and, uh, you know, the dark arts. And, uh, you know, that is uh, more and more something being brought out front for young people, especially to emulate. We have the drag queen story hours, and I want to explain something to you about that. This is not about men impersonating women. That's what it pretends to be. That's what it affects to be. But it's not what it is. What it really is, is men presenting women as monsters. And just understand, that's not okay. All right? It's not cool. There's nothing good about it. Okay, so that's the new schoolhouse. And now we have the new beauty, which is to mutilate and disfigure yourself as much as possible so that you look like a savage. And that's uh, something that, that has be become a fad. And 
probably almost certainly spread by transmitters such as Instagram and Facebook and, you know, but especially the visual image based transmitters. Now, a lot of this is happening because of what's known as the uh, Gramscian March through the institutions. Uh, Antonio Gramsci was uh, an Italian uh, anarcho-communist Marxist who and uh, philosopher <clears throat> who was jailed for political agitating in his time, the early 20th century. And one of the uh, things that he promoted was the idea that uh, the Marxist view of things and the Marxist campaign could be assisted by having it march through the institutions, especially of higher education. So that, uh, you know, in a way, it's a, another way of, of capturing a different transmitter. We see that very clearly in our time. You know, I certainly saw that. So I was there at at the birthing of it, I think, in the uh, mid 1960s when I went to college, and uh, that was when you began to get a lot of departments taken over by people who were overtly uh, leftist um, activists. And now that has gone to a terrible extreme, uh, to to the point where many of the the deans and presidents of the colleges are themselves activists, uh, Marxist activists, marching a lot of pernicious ideas through their institutions and um, uh, propagandizing their students. And we see the results of that now in the streets. You can see a little bit of, you know, how this operates uh, psychologically, and, and this is kind of a precursor to the mass formation psychosis, is that, you know, you get a lot of what has been described as cluster B personality disorders more and more in a culture that that promotes loneliness, purposelessness, uh, loss of identity, <clears throat> and other um, negative uh, influences on personality. And <clears throat> Excuse me. You see how it ends up being actually visibly expressed, even in the architecture of the institutions. This is uh, MIT's Status Center, uh, designed by Frank Geary, uh, went up about ten years ago, and you can see how it. it interestingly, it seems to mimic the um, uh, set design of German expressionist horror movies of the nineteen twenties and does it really rather self-consciously. And it is yet another way of disordering and disorienting the public, especially the young public, the young people in our culture who go to these institutions to be educated and trained. Uh, I think that there's something that's generally not understood about the whole woke phenomena as it's come to be called. You know, some of us call it the oppression Olympics. Who can be a bigger victim than anybody else? Um, I sometimes refer to it as Marxism with American characteristics, an intersectional hierarchy of complaint. And uh, the, the real uh, dynamic behind it is that it's basically a status competition. Uh, and it is... Uh, it's regulated by uh, the um, dispensing of brownie points for being the most oppressed and, and most victimized victim of all the categorical victims out there. And it's obviously it's a game, too. It's a psychological game. It's a trip that's being laid on us. But it's also a hustle uh, in the sense that uh, it's dishonest. And... Um, uh, what the hustle really uh, uh, is based on is uh, hustling for um, brownie points and payoffs for being a victim. So that's how that actually works. There's some, another element of it that is poorly understood, and I think it's important to know that uh, it's also very sadistic. Wokeism is actually 
uh, a, a sadistic subculture that um, thrives on uh, the punishments that it can dole out to its opponents. And so you see the woke people out there with all of their complaints and campaigns and uh, activist movements uh, trying as hard as possible to punish their adversaries and opponents, namely their, quote, oppressors, the people who they affect to be oppressed by. And do not underestimate the payoff that is derived, the, the pleasure that they take in these sadistic punishment campaigns, because a great deal of it is about deriving pleasure from harming other people. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, which uh, began, I believe, in 2018 with uh, the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, when Mr. Obama was president, really gelled and, and went up uh, an order of magnitude with the George Floyd killing. My best uh, uh, guess about it is that George Floyd probably died of the combination of a fentanyl overdose and, uh, you know, being in a extremely stressful situation of having been arrested, holding drugs, uh, and then probably even uh, uh, swallowing uh, some of what he was carrying with him. And in any case, he died. Uh, a police officer, several police officers were blamed for it, one principally and uh, tried and convicted for murder. And um, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement uh, really got a lot of uh, uh, a lot more traction, but it too was basically a hustle. And um, look, hold on a second. Seem to have, yeah, okay. It too is basically a hustle, and of course, uh, it's important to also to know that you know a hustle is a dishonest way of getting something, whether it's status or something else. The something else in this case was a whole lot of money. A whole lot of money was funneled out of the federal government into Black Lives Matter. The George Floyd. Uh, Extended family received $27 million in compensation for his death, um, really just a payoff. And uh, the people who were running Black Lives Matter were out buying expensive Los Angeles real estate with the money that they raised. So, uh, so get this, that, you know, a hustle is a dishonest uh, effort to gain something, and often it's money. There are a lot of influencers behind this who have uh, shady, mysterious, uh, and mystifying uh, motives that we're trying to understand, of course. Uh, and, and But the key to it is that we can locate exactly who they are. We're just not exactly, and, and also what they're doing. We just can't exactly say what's in it for them at least for many of them. There is, of course, Klaus Schwab and his outfit. You know, he made a statement last week in China that uh, uh, his organization expected that the time had come for governments to compel their citizens to start acting according to the World Economic Forum's uh, prescriptions for behavior, you know, eating bugs, having nothing, and renting everything. And he seemed to be very uh, exercised uh, and upset about the fact that uh, they hadn't accomplished it yet. Um, we know that uh, Zuckerberg, the guy who runs Meta or, or Facebook, the founder of Facebook, gave hundreds of millions of dollars to local uh, election precincts in swing states in the election of 2020. So we don't know what is uh, apart from you know, uh, uh, helping to get elected the faction that represents the intel blob in America. Uh, it's hard to tell whether he was being coerced into doing that or whether he did it of his free will. Barack Obama, Obama is a shadowy figure in our politics, despite being front and center on our stage for all those years. 
um, uh, there's a, a fair there's a fair chance that he himself is being blackmailed for some of his pre-presidential behavior. George Soros uh, appears to simply hate Western civilization and would like to harm it. His activities are now being run by his son, Alex, who appears to be just simply stupid. Um, uh, Tedros running the WHO. We're not sure what his uh, motives are besides power, but um, they played a big role in coordinating the uh, uh, misbehavior that went on with COVID-19. Ditto Bill Gates and the whole pharmaceutical industry. Um, Joe Biden, we know uh, there is a ton of evidence that he received payments from China, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, uh, many other countries during the time he was vice president. And then afterwards, when he was out of office, peddling his influence. And then we have the big financials. You know, BlackRock is reputed to have some kind of a contract pending to rebuild Ukraine once the war there is concluded, if it is concluded uh, or, or, you know, supposedly concluded by NATO. That is, you know, uh, our side, supposedly. Uh, I doubt that's going to happen, actually. So you have all these people operating in the background. It's it's not clear to us exactly what their role is and how it works, but there may be prosecutions in their futures, and that will help us find out. One of the big uh, uh, problems with all of this is that we have divorced reality from truth, you know, especially with all of this BS about uh, these new this new species of uh, information called misinformation and disinformation. Um, we have when you divorce reality from truth, uh, you end up with a population that cannot make sense of the culture and the politics that it's immersed in. And so one of the big projects that we have ahead of us is to uh, try to arrange a remarriage of these, these two uh, best friends. So all this preceding talk raises the question, what are we going to do about it? Um. Let's face it, we're really in combat with these nefarious forces uh, and to some extent with our own governments. Uh, and um, it's a very hard war. It's largely an information war. And as I've reiterated more than twice, it is making it very, very difficult for us to understand what reality is and to reach a consensus about anything that we can do to uh, 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 get our minds right and get our cultures right again. We have an idea of what this globalist agenda is. Uh, it uh, seems to want to form some kind of a centralized globalist control over us. It attempts to be arranging things so that we become uh, uh, impoverished uh, slaves subject to their management. We can certainly see the uh, mechanisms of censorship underway. We hear them proclaim in so many words that we should eat bugs and that you know they are liable to start destroying the agriculture systems that we depend on. They want to concentrate all their power as much as possible into the fewest hands. And they want to watch everything that we do and control our movements. And all of these things are things that should make a sane person feel comfortable. I, I also hasten to point out <clears throat> that <clears throat> these things that the, the, the so-called globalists, if we let's just bunch them up under that rubric, that these things that the globalists want seem to really be at odds with the actual macro trends that are underway, the true dynamics that are underway in this part of world history. For one thing, 
uh, well, let's just run through them. The trend towards uh, centralizing power is actually moving in the other direction. The world wants to relocalize. The zeitgeist wants to take us in the direction of relocalizing, not further centralizing we've we can't stand or bear any more centralizing so it wants to take us back in the other direction um we are uh, we're going to have to downscale probably most of the activities that we do and that means the scale of business the scale of manufacturing and transport uh the scale of finance and banking uh the scale of development the scale of uh, urbanism, uh, the scale of virtually everything we do has got to get smaller and finer. Uh, at the same time, the macro trend is not to centralize, but to decentralize, so that more power and more decision making happens uh, at, at the lower part of the hierarchy, not the upper tiny one tenth of one percent. And finally, the uh, another important macro trend is to de decomplexify systems that are now so hyper complexified that they have made themselves super fragile and subject to collapse. And that is very important to understand. I wrote a book called The Long Emergency, which was about this process. Uh, uh, I published it in 2005, which was now quite a while ago. I would say one of the things that I probably missed was how badly this journey would disorder the minds of the people who were going through it. And that's probably now the most prominent feature of all of the modules of this long emergency that we're seeing, the... the um, uh, collapse of economies, the epidemic diseases, the tyrannical uh, impulses of government, etc., the collapse of agriculture. Um, and uh, uh, we have quite a way to go before this an, uh, is played out. And we have a role in doing what we can to make sure that it, it plays out in such a way that the human project can continue and thrive. A lot of people uh, cry for solutions to all of these problems that we see. But of course, uh, a lot of them aren't actually problems. They're predicaments and quandaries. And they do not lend themselves to the idea of solutions. But, uh, but they do lend themselves to uh, intelligent response, uh, not necessarily you know solutions, but responses that are better than other responses. My new theory of history is very, very complex, and it goes like this. Things happen because they seem like a good idea at the time. That's it. Things happen because they seem like a good idea at the time, and then times change. And then things that used to seem like a good idea aren't such a good idea anymore. And that is one of the things that's largely behind the disordering of our culture. Uh, a very big part of the long emergency book that I wrote was about the petroleum quandary. And that has really fallen far from away from the center of the arena in the last uh, 10 years since the beginning of the so-called shale oil miracle. But I wanna just remind you briefly that we are still stuck in this quandary about oil. It's not going away. And in fact, we're closer to the end of the story than we were to the middle of the story. And I'll just briefly try to show you why without loading too much statistical BS on you. The good old days of the oil, uh, Fiesta, let's say the 1950s in Texas, it cost between uh, it cost about four hundred thousand dollars in today's money, in today's dollars, to drill a Texas or Oklahoma well, and it produced thousands of barrels a, uh, a day for decades. It was like a cash register. You know, you were able to pay off 
all of the investment within the first few months of the project. And then this oil well just kachinga, kachinga, kachinga paid you off for 10, 20, 30 years. That's how great it was. It was cheap and it had high flows of petroleum. Shale oil, in contrast, cost between six to $12 million per well to drill. And they produce, you know, around 100 barrels a day for the first three years. In fact, the first year, they generally drop off by 60%. And then you have to, you know, start the redrilling, refracking, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It is very expensive. It also involves the transportation of a lot of uh, fracking fluid, water, uh, chemicals, sand for the fracking operations to hold the 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 fractured fracks open. And um, altogether, it does not have the same profile at all of what we think of as conventional oil. Um, I'm not going to get into it here, but the the other unconventional types of oil production, uh, uh, deep drilling under the water, like the Gulf of Mexico and the North Sea, are also very, very expensive and, and also have uh, uh, environmental hazards that are uh, extreme, shall we say. So, you know, one of the proposed ideas is that we're going to just electrify the automobile fleet and continue to, to enjoy mass motoring and everything will be just fine. And uh, that's probably not going to happen. You know, from, from the systems standpoint, uh, uh, it, it ain't happening for a number of reasons. One, one is we can't get the price of electric vehicles into a range that the middle class can afford at the same time that the middle class is losing traction uh, in the economy and uh, collapsing, actually, you might say. Uh, and as a technical matter, you know, um, to make all of these electric vehicles dependent on the electric grid would overstress the electric grid. And we probably don't have an electric grid sturdy enough to handle all of that charging if we were to replace the same number of vehicles or even you know a substantial portion of them. So uh, from a technical standpoint, the thing is a wash. From the social standpoint, it's a wash. Uh, also from the, the strictly, um, shall we say, economic slash marketing standpoint, it's, uh, it, it doesn't work. The car dealers selling the internal combustion cars for the last 10 years have had to bend over backwards to create loans that their increasingly stressed customers can bear. So they've been giving, you know, seven, eight year loans to used cars that uh, lose all their value within the first three or four years of the car loan. And then, you know, the, after that, the collateral of the loan, the car is worthless. And they can't take that model any further. Um, and so they increasingly what you see is that people simply can't afford to buy cars the way people in North America are accustomed to buying cars on installment loans, you know, paying them off over time. And if they can't do that, the car industry is going to get in a lot of trouble. And I want to point out to you that the way the car in industry is organized and scaled they have to sell, you know, millions of units a year to stay in business. The Ford Motor Company is not going to stay in business sell selling 150,000 cars a year. OK, you got that. So uh, there's a whole range of social, uh, practical, technical, economic reasons why we're in trouble with this. Now, I have to take a sip of my drink here and I have to cough. So excuse me for a second. <clears throat> The great alt energy fantasy of the last 20, 30 years is that we're simply going to, you know, uh, plug all the stuff that we've been using so far uh, by, uh, you know, uh, in an oil based economy into uh, the electric uh, system. And then we'll just run everything that way. That's not going to happen either. N we're not going to run the uh the interstate highway system the u.s military the canadian military the um uh, disney world uh the consumer economy 
um, agribusiness on any combination of solar, wind, tidal, uh, used French fried potato oil, or you name it. It just isn't going to happen. And we're discovering that now to our sorrow. Uh, uh, we see, th see that being enacted very vividly in a place like Germany now, where uh, they have uh, put themselves in such a terrible quandary. They have decommissioned their um, nuclear energy industry for uh, generating electric power with nukes. Uh, they've discovered that wind power and solar power is insufficient to run their stuff. And then they allowed the USA to commit an act of war on them by blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline that would have guaranteed them at least some decades of cheap natural gas from Russia to run their industry. So, you know, one of the uh, conclusions you can come to is that having made those really bad, really bad choices, uh, Germany and perhaps uh, much of uh, Europe altogether is now going to start going medieval. We'll see how that plays out. Stand by. So one of the other ideas that we we hear expressed all the time is that we don't know exactly how we're going to work our way through this, but they will come up with something. You know, the 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 so-called mad scientists, the experts, the technocrats, they'll figure something out so that we keep we can keep on living exactly the way we are living now uh, by other means. And that's a fantasy that we're going to have to uh, drop pretty soon. I, I, I hasten to point out it is also somewhat consistent with the uh, World Economic Forum's uh, idea that we are going to have to live differently. You know, the question is, are we going to live in a centralized tyranny or are we going to live in a much more a saner, distributed, uh, uh, differently disposed economy? And that's that's the uh, kernel of what we have to figure out. So, you know, we made we make a lot of bad decisions. We continue to make bad decisions and bad choices. And uh, many of them are based on various fantasies that we're indulging in because we are uh, becoming, you know, semi-psychotic. Uh, we're under the spell of this mass formation. So one of the other dumb ideas we came up with is that we're going to grow all our food in these giant million-dollar structures, which is absurd, of course, because, you know, that's what the ground is for, for growing stuff on the ground. The, the catch is you probably have to grow it differently than we're growing it now. We're probably not going to be de uh, able to depend on petroleum-based agriculture a whole lot longer. And that means not just the fuel for the giant machines, but the feedstock for the fertilizers and the herbicides and pesticides. We're probably going to have to do a kind of farming that uh, happens on a smaller scale that requires more human attention directly and probably, uh, at least quite possibly, animal labor. And we're going to have to stand by on how that works. We're fortunate that some people are still doing it that way, and they may be around to train uh, people who will continue to do that. I, I want to talk for a while about this problem of inhabiting the landscape. Uh, I wrote three books about urban design and architecture, and I, I was prompted uh, simply by living through the era in the late 20th century when the American landscape was deeply suburbanized. Uh, I, I moved to Long Island with my parents in 1954 when it was one of the loveliest landscapes in America. It had land, uh, Long Island is an island that sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean off of New York City, <clears throat> and it has a wonderful, mild microclimate and its own uh, special uh, flora and a very long growing season. <clears throat> it was for uh, a couple of centuries the place that the wealthy people of New York repaired to their estates. Uh, and starting after the Second World War, we had a giant land rush um, and the idea there was to continue 
the suburban project that had initially started in the 1920s. And that's when you got the first flush of automobile-based suburbia. We had an earlier iteration of, of railroad-based suburbia, uh, but there wasn't that much of it. And then we got streetcar-based, tram-based suburbia, uh, of which there was quite a bit, but that was a short-lived era. It only went from about 1890 to the 1920s. And from the 1920s, we began this project of suburbanizing uh, America and Canada with the car. We had a lot of real estate outside of our cities. We, we live on a large continent. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of land out there. That, you know, and we had, we had favorable property ownership laws that allowed that, this kind of development to happen. And we put all these ideas together. And it seemed like a good idea at the time. You know, people, uh, there was an, another element of this is uh, in America and probably in Canada too, to some extent, our big cities weren't all that nice. They had grown up in tandem with the industrial revolution and all of its obnoxious procedures. And um, by the time you get to the early 20th century, uh, the, the scale of them becomes overwhelming and unpleasant. And people are starting to get very, anxious for fresh air and light. And all of that starts to become resolved with this idea of the, the new automobile suburb so that everybody can basically uh, lead a private country living existence uh, at home and then commute into the, you know, the business uh, located in the great urban um, metropolis. And that idea ruled for a while. And then, of course, the businesses were decanted from the metropolises and the shopping along with it. And all of that activity starts happening in the office park and the suburban mall. And, you know, so pretty, pretty soon the landscape is overwhelmed with suburban crapola. And um, I, I'd like to remind you of my principal uh, definition of the, the disorder of suburbia that you see visually. Um, the all that suburban um, uh, disorder is really entropy made visible. So you understand how deeply destructive it is to the human spirit, to human economy and uh, culture. Uh, in in every dimension of human life, suburbia has been destructive. Um, and um, but we've also got terrible problems with city life. Now, there, there are basically four ways of inhabiting the landscape in this world and have been for uh, millennia. You, you have uh, towns, you have cities, you have suburbs, and you have the rural life, agricultural life. And that's basically it. Um, our, our cities beginning in the late 19th century attained a scale that was becoming increasingly a problem and increasingly in different ways. And we, we tried to address them one by one. You know, the, the problem with the obnoxious industry we addressed by inventing zoning so that uh, after a certain point in the 1920s, all of the obnoxious factories had to be in a particular sector of the urban fabric and had to be kept away from the places where people lived. But, you know, as the decades went on, we took that zoning idea to ridiculous extremes. We decided, for example, that shopping was an obnoxious activity that people shouldn't be allowed to live around. And hence, you get, you know, this extreme disaggregation of the suburban uh, housing subdivision <clears throat> and the strip mall and the mall and the highway strip. And, uh, uh, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. But anybody who has experienced that way of life knows that it has a pernicious effect uh, on the human spirit and, and particularly on the development of children who really are not able to use their environment with those characteristics. They have to be chauffeured around by the family chauffeur to all of their activities, and they no longer enjoy the development of their sovereign individuality, their wayfinding abilities, and more generally, their ability to navigate through life later on as adults. 
So the scale of our cities now has uh, attained a kind of critical threshold where they are no longer um, in sync with the resource and capital realities of the future. The resources are not going to be there and the money is not going to be there to continue servicing them, uh, fixing them, maintaining them and redeveloping them. One of the quandaries with this is the uh, megastructure problem that we have in, in most of us, in many of our cities, we have too many giant buildings that don't lend themselves to redevelopment. It's only been in the last four years that we've vividly seen how badly this can go wrong. And you'll recognize this when I, as I explain it to you. You know that during COVID, one of the chief manifestations of that crisis was that people stopped going to work in the city, and in particular in the office towers. Uh, they were working at home on the internet off their laptops. And when the crisis peaked and started to wane and go away, they never returned to their offices, at least a great many of them didn't. And so we're now seeing a situation in the big cities in the USA anyway, uh, I dare say it's probably similar in Toronto um, uh, and Vancouver, we're seeing that uh, giant office skyscrapers are often 40% vac vacant. And the problem is, is that the business model for running a megastructure like that is broken. Uh, if you if you can't run it at a higher occupancy than you know half filled, uh, you can't cover the mortgages on these buildings. Almost always, these these buildings are mortgaged because that's part of the business model for developing a skyscraper. So you do it with other people's money, and then you make your money back through a formula of collecting rents. Uh, but you also have to pay. The real estate taxes, which are enormous because it's an enormous building in a high value part of the landscape, and you have to pay for maintenance and uh, you know everything else that goes into running a building. So that business model is broken, and now you're seeing fire sales of skyscrapers. It's starting to happen in the places that are especially distressed, like San Francisco and New York City. That trend is going to increase and it's going to become a bigger and bigger crisis, economic crisis for the cities, because as those properties are devalued, their taxes are going to go down and the cities are going to receive less revenue every year from these properties. Also, they're not going to be renovated. Um, the capital is not going to be there to renovate them. They're not going to be turned into residential skyscrapers um, because uh, you've got to uh, uh, figure this in to, your, to how you look at this. The residential skyscrapers are accessories to the office towers. And if people are not going to the office towers, <clears throat> they're not going to be buying and renting a place to live in the adjacent residential tower, or at least one that's maybe five or 10 blocks away. So you see this quandary really starting to intensify over the last several years, but I don't think we're incorporating uh, the knowledge of how this works into our economic forecasting and, and, and the consensus of what we're going to do. The upshot of all of this is that our cities are going to get smaller. They cannot remain uh, at the scale that they have attained now. They're going to contract. They're, some of them may contract severely. The process is going to be probably very disorderly. There's probably going to be battles over who gets to occupy the places that have retained their value. For example, the historic districts, the waterfronts, because water transport is going to become a much bigger thing in the future. And I'll get to that in a minute. So the, prepare for the contraction of the cities uh, and for the failure to be able to fix the stuff that uh, has to get fixed in them. And that includes the uh, services. You know, in, in any cycle, in any end of cycle, you tend to get gigant gigantism. You get it in nature. And you could see what happened with the great uh, land ma mammals of the Pleistocene or the uh, Oligocene, uh, I guess it is. 
where you know these creatures uh, assumed a scale that just ended up not working for them, and uh, they vanished. Well, I've described some of the problems with suburbia, but the main thing to understand about it is that it, it's not going to work anymore. The business model for suburbia is also failing. Uh, what's principally failing is the financial model because uh, uh, of our problem, our tremendous problems with debt and the structuring of debt and the way debt has been modeled for the average household. And also, especially with the twilight of mass motoring, because we are fading out from that. Uh, you know, the World Economic Forum may be correct about that too, but for nefarious reasons, you know, uh, uh, driving cars has been a lot of fun, but we're probably not gonna be able to do it anymore uh, after a certain point. It's, it's just not gonna become economically feasible. And as it becomes, remember this, as mass motoring becomes incrementally less democratic, it's going to generate more resentment from the people who can no longer do it. So remember that. So suburbia is uh, out of the question. What is a plausible urban scale for the future? Well, here's what I think we'll see in North America, probably what it has been in urbanism for centuries until uh, 1900. That is, you know, buildings generally under, you know, five, six stories, uh, generally walkable uh, uh, vertically, generally zoned vertically and mixed use with the, you know, retail on the ground floor and other activities upstairs. This is our model. Now, this happens to be Troy, New York, uh, a fine old industrial city, which for various reasons retained a lot of its urban fabric, didn't get destroyed in the late 20th century. It's mostly vacant and it's sitting there waiting to be reactivated. This is the European version. This is uh, the old uh, section, the old district of Stockholm. And, uh, you know, th these two are very similar in scale and fabric. Uh, the Europeans decorate it uh, better. They have a better sense of of uh, artistry that they're, they're more consciously artistic about how they go about urban design than we are. Um, then there's this other thing that's neither city or suburb, and it's a small town. And I uh, submit to you that the small town in North America is where the action will be moving. Uh, they were the places that uh, suffered the most disinvestment in our lifetime, and they will be the locus of the most investment in the future, largely because, uh, and largely when they are places that exist in proximity to viable agriculture, to food production. That's going to be terribly important. Uh, we're going to have to start producing products again of some kind. Um, you know, it, 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 we'll really be faced with a choice. I mean, are we going to go full medieval? Or are we going to, you know, still be able to make some things for ourselves again that we can, you know, uh, provide some comfort and convenience in life, even if it's only a broom? Um, so uh, we know how to do it, but we're going to have to do it on a smaller scale again. Um, I think you can state categorically that everything organized on the giant scale will fail, whether it's a giant university, a giant retail chain, a giant transportation system, a giant bank, a giant government blah, 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 they'll all fail. Uh, the future is not going to be about parking. It will be about other things. So, you know, when your locality starts entertaining idiotic ideas about building parking structures, change the subject. I give you the Mall of Tomorrow, which was the original infrastructure for commerce in North America, very similar in Canada and the USA, it will be coming back again because all of the big box stores, all of the malls, all of the giant chains are going down. We are probably going to be saying farewell to a lot of modular built building materials, including things like uh, uh, extruded claddings, sheetrock, uh, you know, large scale I beams, and and. Uh, perhaps strand board, plywood, things like that. We're probably more and more 
going to have to go back to relying on materials found in nature. We know how to use them. They generally produce a better result than the modular stuff. The modular stuff, think of the modular stuff as, as being uh, uh, cursed with the diminishing returns of technology, namely blowback. So you get an apparent immediate return on being able to use the easy to snap together modular uh, components. But in the long run, you get a worse city, a worse town and a worse building. Uh, the uh, economy of North America is going to be more focused on our continent per se. Uh, we're still going to have probably international trade, but reduced uh, in scale. And uh, one of the things that we have in North America is a wonderful inland waterway system, including the Great Lakes and the Great Rivers. And that includes your rivers in Canada and your parts of the Great Lakes. <clears throat> and um, that's where a lot of the transport action is going to be moving as the trucking industry fails and as we have trouble rebuilding the railroad system to scale, to accommodate things. So we have a lot of things that we have to take care of. And there are, uh, uh, we, we are faced with making a lot of, with having a lot of intelligent responses to this long emergency I've described. You know, we're going to have to reorganize the way we inhabit the landscape. Uh, people are going to have to probably, will probably be compelled to flee the cities at some rate or to some extent and the suburbs and how are they going to relocate well we're going to have to we're going to have to re uh, you know we're going to have to get back into the towns and turn what we can that was suburban into viable towns we're not going to see a whole lot of that suburbia really has three destinies slums ruins and salvage not necessarily in that order we're going to have to uh, rebuild agriculture more farms, more equitably distributed under smaller ownerships with more human attention and probably less mechanized, less petroleum-based uh, activity. Uh, we're going to have to reorganize commerce uh, on the small local scale. Uh, it will be a really good thing for our localities because there will be many niche occupations and vocations for people to do things and make a living and have a purpose in life, uh, you know, namely all the layers of a fine-grained uh, distributive uh, network of uh, wholesalers, jobbers, retailers, et cetera, you know, transporters. And uh, that's not that hard. This is not one of the harder things you have to do. We're going to have to redo education on a smaller scale. Uh, a lot of it is simply going to go away. The big centralized high schools that are designed to look like insecticide factories, bye bye they're gone. They're going to be history. Uh, probably university education will once again become some kind of an elite activity at a much smaller scale. And a lot of the big public universities will fail. Uh, and many of the small private ones, too. Uh, in my region, many they're failing uh, uh, in, in large numbers already. And... We're going to have to learn how to make things again, probably uh, with more art, artisanal focus and probably with uh, more craft than we have till now. So uh, I just want to leave you with this. You know, we're acting like a nation of clowns. We're even dressing like a nation of clowns. Look, notice that this guy's dressed like a four year old child. OK, that's not OK to pre if you're an adult to present yourself that way. We're going to have to start getting serious again. I don't know what the costume of the 21st century is going to be, but this isn't good enough. Sends a bad message. We have a very big to-do list of things that we got to attend to, and we're going to because we're going to be compelled to do it. Uh, you know, the way things really work is that societies are uh, uh, emergent organisms, and they will self-organize according to the messages, the signals that they get from reality, which, by the way, is one of the reasons why you have to have a clear and coherent uh, consensus about what reality is about. 
because you you have to be able to understand and interpret these these signals and these signals are telling us as i've said get smaller get finer downscale get more local and get ready for a new disposition of things it it doesn't necessarily have to be a terrible new way of life in the you know world economic vein it can be a life of purpose artistry aspiration hope uh, beauty and many of the things that we've actually left behind in our rush to become uh, uh, a uh, you know a technocratic, a robotic nirvana, which I can assure you now ain't going to happen. So keep your eye on that ball, on all them balls. And uh, thanks for your attention. And I guess we'll move to the next module of this talk. Everybody Thank still you. there? So yeah, I am. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Jim. I'm just setting expectations. We have about 10 minutes of Q&A before Art uh, calls time on the official 90-minute program. Um, and uh, for those of you who came late, we're going to take a five-minute uh, bio break after that and then uh, do another session of recorded Q&A that might show up as a separate posting. And um, Richard Vanderjack, uh, you are on deck. Please uh, turn on your mic and your video. And in the meantime, I'm gonna take my prerogative as the master of ceremonies and say, Jim, uh, you have so many interesting ideas, some which jar and, and maybe by design, um, but uh, I didn't <clears throat> hear you speak about uh, the ecological overshoot unraveling. Um, it, you know, for example, you said that they will dismantle agriculture. Agriculture as uh, production per capita is one of the uh, precursors to the collapse, sometimes called unraveling, which is actually a better description because parts of society might continue. And uh, your world, actually, I, I think it's very useful information that you presented to us worth uh, thinking and studying about. Uh, but the world of 1850, before the hydrocarbon industry really got cranked up, uh, there were only 1.2 billion people. And as much as you are presenting solutions, you are not presenting solutions for the six and a half billion people that apparently are going to go away. Do you yeah. have any comments on this? Yeah, um, uh, the the planet is, li is likely to not be able to support that number of people. Um, history, uh, at, just as societies are emergent, history is uh, an emergent uh, organism in its own way. And history is going to uh, take care of the problem. Uh, there will be fewer of, a, fewer of us. So there are going to be battles and contests over resources. And uh, we're going to have problems with... Uh, th there will be... Uh, the, the, the transition into what the post-technocratic phase of history is going to be is certain to be disorderly. And that and is probably going to be uh, very difficult for people. So uh, let's put it this way: just as there's not going to be any kind of central centralized ruling of mankind on a global basis, I don't believe there's going to be any centralized uh, uh, quote solution to the population problem. Uh, human beings have a limited lifespan, and uh, attrition is always. Uh, like rust never sleeps. So you just have to, I think, accept the fact that you're not going to, in any centralized way, control the population. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Richard, are you there? Um, I believe he's logged off. Okay. Um, so we have very few minutes uh, left. Uh, Art, you actually made a comment. Do you want to take your question now? I I'm going to... Well, in the other recorded session, we'll go back on the written, but you know, the people who have left, because I think some of those comments and questions are worth uh, studying. But uh, I'd, I'd like to save this time for people who are still here. So Art, do you have your question? Do you want to ask one? Yes. Um, <clears throat> and uh, G Strong is on deck. Okay. You, you made it very clear that uh, major social change is, is about to occur. We might debate what is going to drive it, but it still leads to the same conclusion that we, we have to um, change our, our way of living. We have to live differently. 
uh, considerably differently if we are going to survive as a species. And um, uh, one of the things which I, I have personally looked at for, for some time uh, is this business of survival. Who are the people who are going to survive uh, the, this, um, uh, this very dynamic changing environment, whatever the driver is? And uh, one thing that is, is um, absolutely vital is the continuation of having energy. And because we are, we cannot go back to just uh, plowshares and, 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 and using uh, uh, animals, uh, although I'm sure we, uh, we, we will uh, as, as uh, circumstances warrant and in different parts of the world. But we do have um, unlimited amount of energy and it's called in the sun and in, in the core of the earth. Um, <clears throat> the entire universe is made up of, of uh, uh, nuclear reactions in, in the stars and, and uh, uh, this has been going on for a very long time. And, and that energy is certainly tappable in terms of right now, um, the, the wind will always blow and the sun will always come up. What's and, the question, Art? And the earth, I'm, I'm getting that. Um, and so ultimately, my question to you is, do you see any future at all in the use of microgrids, in, in uh, decentralizing the power uh, production capacity? I believe you said you do in, in decentralization. But this also means uh, agglomeration, a certain way of collecting the uh, microgrids together to make virtual power plants, which are local and controlled by, by local people. Do you see that as something that is likely to happen? Uh, not in the way you're suggesting. Uh, I think the most likely thing to happen will be that people who are fortunate to live in uh, certain regions are going to be able to possibly cobble together hydroelectric power. But we're not going to be manufacturing. Uh, we're not going to be mass producing solar cells and and uh, you know wind turbines made out of exotic materials. Forget about it. Well, windmills have been around a long time. Well, yeah. Well, it depends what you use it for. You know, if you use it for you know, draining a draining a, a, a you know a, a backwater or something that that works, but you know, are you going to light a town of ten thousand people? Hmm. Probably not with a windmill. Uh, in the early going, it, you know, there's going to be a lot of equipment lying around, and a lot of uh, people are going to very ingeniously cobble together systems with what's left, you know, on an increasingly small scale. So there may be some of that. But, um, you know, I, I don't think that that um, is going to last very long. I'll tell you another thing that I, is very problematical. Um, if the authorities, uh, before they, uh, uh, before this part of the cycle is over with the attempt to globalize everybody, if they... Um, if they if they use too much electronic based digital computerized stuff to annoy annoy people you're going to see people in the USA anyway maybe western canada going around shooting out the relays and shooting out the uh, uh tr the transformers of the electric grid uh just to stop being um, uh, victimized by, uh, you know, a digital tyranny. And that's something that you ought to think about, is that the electric grid does not, does not come without the possibility of being used as a principal tool for tyranny in the short run. run. So, uh, you know, there's I'm also the reading. problem that the, the grid itself, as we know it, is uh, the the biggest uh, machine in the world, and is extremely fragile because of that. 
all the more reason to go to distributed energy resources. Well, yeah, sure, but it's going to be uh, it's going to be a very half-assed uh, cobbled together thing. You know, my objection to what you're saying is the same uh, objection I had a few minutes ago. Don't expect top-down uh, solutions to these things. Uh, th there are two kinds of techno. There are two kinds of narcissism I see operating in our culture that are very problematic, to use a woke word. Uh, one is techno narcissism, which is obvious. You know, everybody's saying, oh, well, we're just going to tech our way out of these problems. The other one is organizational narcissism, the idea that we're going to form a bunch of committees and boards and organizations that are going to organize our way out of this. That ain't going to happen. This is going to be a very, very disorderly transition. And, uh, you know, we'll be lucky if on a community basis you can get some things going that benefit everybody. But don't expect large organizational campaigns to make these kinds of things happen. Because, you know, once once we start sliding down that greasy pole, uh, it, it's going to be a fast slide. You I mean, can't hear you. Oh, you're muted. Okay. If we have time, can we uh, get Jeff Strong and Samrat in before we call time on this first session? Okay, yeah. Jeff Strong, can you come forward and ask your question? Yeah, you've, uh, okay. Um, I can't control the video, but uh, James, you you probably know that one of our major programs in KCOR is focused on anthropogenic climate change, which causes impacts uh, possibilities for mitigation, adaptation, and that sort of thing. And a lot of the things you spoke of here this morning, we relate at least partially to climate change. So my question is, what are your thoughts on anthropogenic climate change? Uh, I tend to disbelieve most of the theories associated with it. Uh, I tend to think that most of it is BS and that the actual problem is you know, the climate changes cyclically throughout uh, uh, world history, uh, through geological history and through human history at different rates and cycles within cycles. And we have seen many cycles of uh, weather change, climate change, um, just in the last 2000 years. The problem we face really is not so much climate change. The problem is that we have a technocentric um, society that is so hyper complex that it is also hyper fragile and it it, it is not capable of adapting uh, in the way that uh, previous human cultures were able to adapt. And uh, I, I think that uh, most of the mitigation schemes are fantasies that are never going to come about. And we really have to concentrate uh, our energy on adapting to the changes at hand and, um, you know, not uh, fool ourselves too much about, uh, you know, not get lost in the data. You know, one of the one of the real delusions of our time is this idea that if you can collect enough information, if you can measure enough stuff, you can control everything. And I think that that's just B.S., and I think it's a dangerous delusion. So uh, I encourage people not to go down that path. But James, uh, have you studied climate change then? Or are you basically- I wrote a chapter about it in a book called uh, uh, Too Much Magic. Okay, but is that based on just your personal opinion or do you actually understand the science of climate change? Well, I, I, I have what I think of as uh, an understanding of it. I also have to add this. I, I think that the oh, yeah. kind of I think the kind of human activity that you're talking about uh, is going to be um, uh, decreasing so sharply that uh, it's it is going to be stopping whether you, whether you want to continue it or not. So I think it's a moot it's a moot argument. You know, you can get lost in your anthropogenic arguments, but I think it's moot because uh, circumstances are going to take us away from that path anyway, whether we like it or not. We're going to be dragged kicking and screaming away from 
from our technocentric uh, uh, culture. Yeah, okay, but uh, the scientific results are not mute points, but anyway, that's all I have to say. <laughs> There'll be another Q and A session. Please stick around, Jeff. And uh, Samra, you will be the the last um, questioner, and then that means that Ted is up for the official thanks. Right. Hi, James. Thanks uh, for like a really amazing uh, presentation. My question is: In your book, Geography of Nowhere, you mentioned that in North America, people could be using the waterways and the rivers. Yeah. I'd love to hear you speak a little more about it. Well, we're, we have a, we're facing a huge problem with a transportation system based on trucking. Uh, it's not going to persist. It's already going down. The trucking companies, I, I, I speak to people who uh, are involved in trucking uh, weekly, and the trucking companies are in terrible shape. They're going out of business uh, uh, one after another. Um, we do have that wonderful inland waterway that includes many canals. The canals uh, that connect uh, the Hudson River estuary to the St. Lawrence River and, and the Erie Canal that connects to the Great Lakes uh, are both have been kept in immaculate condition by the state of New York by some miracle. So they're still operational. Um, and we have a railroad system that was the envy of the world in 1920 that is out there rusting in the rain, waiting to be fixed. We missed the window of opportunity to build high speed rail because the capital is not going to be available for it. And also because of our property laws in the USA, um, the eminent domain questions are uh, really next to impossible to resolve. Um, and we missed the whole window of opportunity for making that happen. So what we what we are faced with is a need to uh, rebuild as much as we can of the old uh, conventional railroad system and see what we can do with that. And the the waterway system is sort of self-explanatory and self-evident. The Ohio River, the Mississippi River, Missouri River, the Champlain Canal, the Erie Canal, the Hudson River, uh, many other subsidiary canals, the Great Lakes. There you have it. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah. So Ted, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, James, you always uh, stimulate people, don't you? I know that a lot of our uh, members are going to be rather exercised because they're not used to alternative facts and alternative realities. So I suspect in the next part, you are going to be challenged from a number of people who work in the climate sector, who work in banking, who work in growth, who work in the areas that you have been uh, raising issues about, and they may be able to take you on. That said, it will keep people awake, and it will certainly keep the uh, conversation going. So thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. And I'd just like to say we're going to break for a few minutes if people want to take a break and want to pursue any of these things further. Uh, it, uh, we, we really would like people to join the Canadian Association, if you are not already joined, you we would, oh, somebody's speaking, okay. We would like, we would like as well for you to watch all of our presentations that end up on YouTube or on other shared sources. So thank you very much for coming and we will start again in about five or 10 minutes. Thank you. You can open up your screens. You 